Hi, this is Harold in China. I'm today uh, in Shanghai. It's slowly getting a little bit cooler. It was very hot. It still is very hot during the day. Today is slightly cloudy, so that makes it more comfortable. I've been to Beijing for the last three, four weekends, and suddenly after the so-called uh, start of autumn, it's like one of the 24 micro seasons in Chinese traditional calendar, and right after that in Beijing it starts to cool down. So those micro seasons in, in uh, China, they're very precise when you're in Beijing. They don't work for Shanghai, which is way more south. So here it's still hot. Um, and today I do have a topic that I want to talk about. Recently, as you probably all know, Mark Zuckerberg admitted on Joe Rogan's show that uh, the FBI has indeed approached him and explicitly said that um, they expect him to censor. Like, he didn't go into detail how much they forced him to censor and how detailed they told him to censor. He just said, they approached us, they said, there's Russian disinformation, do something. The Hunter Biden laptop story, the New York yeah, Post. Yeah, we have too. Yeah, so you guys censored that as well? So we took a different path than Twitter. Um, I mean, basically the background here is the FBI, I think basically came to us, uh, some, some folks on our team, it was like, hey, um, just so you know, like you should be on high alert. There was the, we we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump of of um, uh, uh, that's similar to that. So just be vigilant. So this has reignited the ongoing discussion in the U.S. about censorship. I want to add like a European Chinese kind of perspective. First of all, I don't want to lie. I'm not against uh, censorship in principle. I mean, it's a question of how much and who decides and what is censored. But I chose to live in China, a country that clearly does manage its social media. Uh, I come from Switzerland. We have had laws against Nazism, laws against racism for decades, and we've always lived very well with them. I do think a system, like the definition, the very definition of a system is something with a purpose and a boundary. So if you don't have a boundary, then it's not a system. And that counts for any type of system, not just a political system. But uh, in, in the case of political systems, if they don't have limits, then they're not political systems, basically. And the US has always had very uh, openly admitted censorship. I mean, you cannot have child pornography in the US, neither on the internet nor on physical photos or magazines. It's illegal and that's good. So categorically, I wouldn't say censorship is something that does not is not allowed and must not exist. That would just be wrong. Any society defines limits of what can and should be said. And the more a society is under stress, typically these limits get more and more tight. If a society feels very at ease, then maybe it can be more tolerant towards what can be said. And the third option is that a society is falling apart. When a, when a country or a society tumbles into chaos, then obviously all these boundaries break up and uh, anything can be said and tried. That was the case after World War II. There are French intellectuals who openly discuss love affairs to 14 year old and even younger girls. So really disgusting stuff that happened because the society was just totally collapsed and yet peace had returned and people felt like, um, well, we're now all peace lovers. We're now all good. Let's open up our minds again. Let's fight back against the propaganda that we've lived through during the wartime. And so, yeah, so these are options. I think what's ideal is a form of limitation that finds general acceptance and that limits as little as possible. And one more thing that's very important is it needs to be in line with the political system. Now, the, the American political system assumes that everybody has the right to form an opinion on everything and join in a public discussion which then decides where the country is going. This kind of liberal democratic model and I think we should be careful like traditionally liberalism and democracy 
the dem democracy were very much opposed ideologies because liberalism was kind of elitist, at least in Britain. They wanted to lift up the people to become able to be free thinkers. So they realized people needed more education, people needed uh, liberal ideals. Whereas the Democrats said the majority decides. And as you may know, in ancient Greece, democracy was a very negative connoted term. So the democracy would be the dictatorship of the masses, of the majority, which inevitably sooner or later will be led by the demagogues. Those who can incite the masses will, will uh, come to power if everybody has the same right to speak. So the Greek definitely favored a rule of the enlightened, of the philosophers, the benevolent rulers basically, and among them, yes, democratic and on equal terms, but not for everyone to join in. The Greeks had always large numbers of slaves, like the farmers, they wouldn't be part of the Greek democracy, what we call democracy nowadays. So a uh, little bit systems theory, but just very simple to say, if everybody can form an opinion and should form an opinion and the government is the result of everybody's opinions, then of course you cannot have the government decide what people see in order to form their opinion because the people themselves should be entitled to, to make that decision. Now, I'm not saying that's the ideal system, as I said, I don't really uh, believe that a highly educated professor spending all her life uh, to, to understand certain, um, certain things in, in, in society, that her opinion would be completely equal to somebody who just simply has not learned anything about a topic. So I'm, I'm much more on the side of like technocrats, meritocracy, but of course there need to be mechanisms that ensure that these experts, these technocrats, these, these uh, uh, meritocratic leaders, that they work in the interest of the people. So that's, that's where this idea of elections came from to say like, we need to ensure that they work in the interest of the people. And that I definitely subscribe to. I don't think elections at the, in the form as they are now, especially in a two-party system, I don't think they work to ensure the government works for the people, but I get the idea. So people in leadership need to be both able and work in the interest of the people. I think that's like the basics that all systems agree upon. And then they try to find different ways how to make it happen. Now, the US says, okay, everybody should form an opinion. In that case, you cannot go ask the government and censor things because what inevitably happens is that people feel, well, you're only attacking my side. So a Republican or Trump supporters, they feel, well, you're trying to censor by only the Trump side. I think many of those who are now crying foul about the, the Hunter Biden laptop story that was, was uh, suppressed by the media, which I think is correct. They cry foul is, is absolutely understandable because indeed the media, they heard about it, they knew it, they didn't investigate, they didn't report on it, which is uh, quite unheard of because usually presidential candidates get roasted in American media. So now those uh, Trump supporters cry foul, why didn't they investigate Hunter Biden? But I think a lot of them, many of them would be really happy to censor you know, like the woke uh, theory, they would be happy to censor like, uh, like, like green, green ideologies. So I'm not going to enter American parties in politics because I just feel whenever you feel like one side really has a good argument, you see like as soon as, as the, 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 the situation flips, then their arguments flip as well. So that's my very outsider view. I'm not an expert on American politics anyways. But what I wanted to say is censorship in a system where everybody should participate is really a contradiction in itself. The system cannot work this way. Now, China is different. China has a rule of experts. The Communist Party is a political party where everybody can apply, but not everybody can join. So there are exams. You need to commit to certain values. And only if you pass those exams, you can even be a party member. And when you're a party member, you're not yet elected. You're not yet uh, in, in, in a government position. Um, so the elections in China work on local level. The people elect people for local parliaments. And then for each higher level, the parliament elects the next higher level 
parliament members. So if you're in, in National People's Congress, you have passed like five levels of parliament. Um, and on the other hand, there's the whole Communist Party hierarchy, which doesn't work with elections, but rather more like a company with promotions. Um, but whether you're a parliament member or a high level in the Communist Party or, or the, the, the administration of the government, uh, you definitely need to be an expert and you need to have proven your skills and abilities to, to achieve things. So there's a very high, uh, like, there's a high um, threshold for people to come into leadership, uh, into leadership positions in Chinese politics. And once they are in these positions, they are ordered and asked to listen to the people. And if we talk about Chinese social media censorship, what's censored is like, um, ideas about how the government should be structured. So you cannot go on Chinese social media and say, well, we should have a multi-party system. That's against the constitution. Or you cannot go, I think Xi Jinping isn't good, we should have Bo Xi Lai instead. These are things where the Chinese Communist Party says, the common people aren't involved in these decisions, they don't understand it, so they should not say anything about it. However, if you complain about, like, my city is dirty, there's too much traffic, um, uh, I, I dislike the way something is managed in my place. Those kind of complaints, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere over the Chinese internet. So that's very much allowed and that's very much how the system works. People state their complaints. They state their worries, they state their needs. At the moment, a lot of people complain about the economic situation, especially like entrepreneurs, small, medium businesses, they, they suffer because of the global economic crisis and because uh, of, of uh, COVID, of course, and because of supply chain crisis, etc., all these problems that you know about. And people complain about that and say that they have problems. And then it's up for the leadership to solve these issues and address them and see how they can look at them. But it's not up um, to everyone to come up with solutions. So again, you can criticize the system if you disagree with it, I think it functions very well and it does a lot of positive for a lot of people. And within its own logic, such a system does not require everybody to be informed about everything. As long as those in leadership are well informed and work in the interest of the people, they can direct the country in the right direction. Um, using their expertise, working together with experts, and the Chinese work very much with experts, be it Chinese professors, or also inviting overseas professors from the US, from Europe. And I've spoken to some professors who were invited to give lectures to Chinese high-level political leaders. They have absolutely no boundaries, so they have no restrictions what they can say. Uh, whenever you're a foreign expert and you speak in a closed panel that is not open to the public, you can say anything and you will even get re-invited despite saying very critical things. But again, those experts are smart enough to focus on Chinese problems rather than uh, lecturing them what they should do. Because the Chinese will always say, look, how we solve the issue, that's our problem. But help us anal analyze from your perspective from how you look at the world, what would be your analysis of our problems. And you can, you can say, look, the problem is one party that doesn't have oversight, so you need multiple parties. But the Chinese will say, well, we tried that, and uh, we had more than 100 political parties, and it was total chaos, and the whole uh, country devolved into civil war again, so that's not working for us. Is it true or not? I mean, again, I'm not a Chinese leader, so I don't want to go here and, and, and make a decision what China should be. I think as it is now, it works well. And um, it explains why I'm much more tolerant to censorship in China than to censorship in the US, because within its own logic of the political system, in China, it's okay as long as the leadership sees the complaints and looks at them seriously and um, addresses those that really affect a lot of people, it's not necessary that there's a big public discussion. 
Whereas in the US, the public discussion is the basis of the political system. So in China, the censorship can be to maintain uh, stability, also to avoid a few very loud people taking the public discussion into a direction that doesn't even interest. I mean, here again, I'm thinking of the woke discussion. Sure, there are problems with racism, with sexism in the US, but a very small number of people can make very extreme demands on US social media and um, they capture the public debate. And that's something that the Chinese don't want. And I think a lot of people in the West more and more also understand that social media, if they're completely uncontrolled, they're not necessarily working in the interest of the majority of the people. It's not like given. So these were my thoughts on censorship. Let me know what you think. I know this is provocative. I know um, a lot of people will find this very disturbing to hear, especially a Swiss person say things like that. So let me know what you think. If you like it, uh, give it a like, please share and uh, forward to others if you think it's worth for them to listen to it. Thanks.